Welcome to chapter one. This is a narrated version of the PowerPoint, so you can listen to it at your leisure. This one is called Economic Thinking. It's for module one. Understanding economics and scarcity. Scarcity means that there are never enough resources to satisfy all human wants. Every society at every level must make choices about how to use its resources. Economics is the study of the trade-offs and choices that we make given the fact of scarcity. Economic opportunity cost, excuse me, is what we give up when we choose one thing over another. Goods and resources, economic goods, goods or services a consumer must pay to obtain, also called scarce goods. Free goods, goods or services that a consumer can obtain for free because they are abundant relative to, to the demand. Productive resources, the inputs used in the production of goods and services to make a profit land, economic capital, labor, and entrepreneurship, also called factors of production. Productive resources. There are four productive resources, also called factors of production. Land, any natural resource, including actual land, but also trees, plants, livestock, wind, sun, water. Economic capital, anything that's used in manufacturing in order to be used in the production of goods and services. Note the distinction between financial capital, which is not productive, and economic capital, which is. While money isn't directly productive, the tools and machinery that it buys can be. Labor, any human service, physical or intellectual, also referred to as human capital. Entrepreneurship, the ability of someone, an entrepreneur, to recognize a profit opportunity, organize the other factors of production, and accept risk. Concept of opportunity cost. Opportunity cost is the value of the next best alternative. Individual decisions in some cases recognizing the opportunity cost can alter a person's behavior. Societal decisions. Opportunity cost comes into play with societal decisions. Universal health care would be nice, but the opportunity cost of such a decision would be less housing, environmental protection, or national defense. These trade-offs also arise with government policies. Labor markets and trade. The division and specialization of labor, division of labor, the way in which the work required to produce a good or service is divided into tasks performed by different workers. Specialization, when workers or firms focus on particular tasks for which they are well suited within the overall production process. Why the division of labor increases production, economies of scale, when the average cost of producing each individual unit declines as total output increases. Labor markets and trade continued. Trade and market specialization only makes sense if workers and other economic agents such as businesses and nations can use their income to purchase the other goods and services they need. Specialization requires trade. The market allows you to learn a specialized set of skills and then use the pay you receive to buy the goods and services you need or want. This is how our modern society has evolved into a strong economy. Micro and macroeconomics. Macroeconomics is the branch of economics that focuses on broad issues such as growth, unemployment, inflation, and trade balance. Microeconomics, the branch of economics that focuses on actions of a particular agent within the economy, like households, workers, and businesses. We learn about the theory of consumer behavior and the theory of the firm. Understanding microeconomics, questions to ask with micro. What determines how households and individuals spend their budgets? What combination of goods and services will best fit their needs and wants, given the budget they have to spend? How do people decide whether to work, and if so, whether to work full-time or part-time? How do people decide how much to save for the future, or whether they should borrow to spend beyond their means? Understanding microeconomics continued. More questions. What determines the products and how many of each a firm will produce and sell? What determines what prices a firm will charge? What determines how a firm will produce its products? What determines how many workers it will hire? How will a firm finance its business? When will a firm decide to expand, downsize, or even close? Understanding macroeconomics. Macroeconomics, that's a policy that pursues goals through monetary policy and fiscal policy. Monetary policy, policy that involves altering the level of interest rates, the availability of credit in the economy, and the extent of borrowing. Fiscal policy, economic policies that involve government spending and, oops, it should say taxes, that's missing. Using economic models. 
Economic model is a simplified version of reality that allows us to observe, understand, and make predictions about economic behavior. Economic models in math. Economic models can be represented using words or using mathematics. Algebra and graphs are utilized to explain economic models. Using economic models, here's an example, circular flow diagram, a diagram indicating that the economy consists of households and firms interacting in a goods and service market and a labor market. The goods and services market, also called the product market, in which firms sell and households buy. Labor market, in which households sell their labor to business firms or other employees. Real world, there are many different markets for goods and services and markets for many different types of labor. The circular flow diagram simplifies these distinctions in order to make the picture easier to grasp. Note, economists don't figure out the solution to a problem and then draw the graph. Instead, they use the graph to help discover the answer. Purpose of functions. Function, a relationship or expression involving one or more variable. In economics, functions frequently describe cause and effect. The variable on the left-hand side is what is being explained, the effect. On the right-hand side is what's doing the explaining, the causes. Economic models tend to express relationships using economic variables, such as budget equals money spent on econ books plus money spent on music. Solving simple equations. Order of operations. When you solve an equation, it's important to do each operation in the following order. Simplify inside parentheses and brackets. Simplify the exponent. Multiply and divide from left to right. Add and subtract from left to right. Lines. In this course, the most common equation you will see is for a line in graphs. Y equals B plus MX. Understanding variables. A variable. A quantity that can assume a range of values represented by a letter or a symbol. For example, Y equals 9 plus 3X. Working with variables. When you're trying to solve an equation with one or more variables, you need to isolate the variable. What does x equal if y equals 12? So what you do is you go ahead and subtract 9 from each side. That gives you 3 equals 3x. Divide by 3 on each side and you get x equals 1. Creating and interpreting graphs. Intercept, the point on a graph where a line crosses the vertical axis or horizontal axis. Slope, the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the horizontal axis. Variable, a quantity that can assume a range of values. X-axis, the horizontal line on a graph commonly represents quantity in economics. Y-axis, the vertical line on a graph commonly representing price in economics. Creating and interpreting graphs continued. If we have an equation for a line that's y equals mx plus b in any equation for a line, m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Interpreting graphs in economics. It is rare for real-world data points to arrange themselves as perfectly as a straight line. It often turns out that a straight line can offer a reasonable approximation of actual data. Interpreting the slope. What the slope means, the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the horizontal axis. A positive slope indicates that two variables are positively related. When one variable increases, so does the other, and vice versa. When one variable decreases, the other also decreases. Interpreting the slope, negative slope. What the slope means, the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the horizontal axis. A negative slope, sometimes called inverse, indicates that two variables are negatively related. When one variable increases, the other decreases, and vice versa. When one variable decreases, the other increases. Interpreting a slope. Zero, what the slope means, the change in the vertical axis divided by the change in the horizontal axis. So a slope of zero indicates that there is a constant relationship between the two variables. When one variable changes, the other does not change at all. How do we calculate the slope? The slope of a straight line between two points can be calculated in numerical terms. To calculate slope, begin by designating one point as the starting point and the other point as the end point, and then calculate the rise over run between these two points. Continuing, graphs of economic relationships are not always straight lines, but often nonlinear curved lines. Can interpret nonlinear relationships similarly to the way we interpret linear relationships. Their slopes can still be positive and negative, and we can calculate them between the two points, looking at the rise over run and the segment of the curve that we are focusing on. Interpreting the slope nonlinear relationships. Nonlinear relationships can be interpreted similar to linear relationships. Their slopes can be positive, as in figure 5, or negative. We can calculate the slope similarly 
also looking at rise over the run of a segment of a curve. A higher positive slope means a steeper upward tilt to the curve, which you can see at higher output levels. A negative slope that is larger in absolute value, that is more negative, means a steeper downward tilt to the line. Interpreting slope continued. Nonlinear relationships can be interpreted similar to linear relationships. A slope of zero is a horizontal line. A vertical line has an infinite slope. If a line has a larger intercept graphically, it would shift out or up from the old origin parallel to the old line. If a line has a smaller intercept, it would shift in or down parallel to the old line. Types of graphs, line. Line graphs show a relationship between two variables, one measured on the horizontal axis and the other measured on the vertical axis. Sometimes it's useful to show more than one set of data on the same axes. The data in the table below is displayed in figure one, which shows the relationship between two variables, length and median weight for American baby boys and girls during the first three years of life. And you can see it's a positive upward sloping line, boys and girls. The line graph measures the length in inches on the horizontal axis and weight in pounds on the vertical axis. So for example, point A on the figure shows that a boy who is 28 inches long will have a median weight of about 19 pounds. So read over from 28, go up, find it on the line, and then go to the left and see 19 pounds. One line on the graph shows the length weight relationship for boys and the other shows the relationship for girls. This kind of graph is widely used by healthcare providers to check whether a child's physical development is roughly on track. There's also pie graphs, sometimes called a pie chart. They're used to show how an overall total is divided into parts. A circle represents a group as a whole. The slices of this circular pie show the relative sizes of subgroups. These pies show how the U.S. population was divided among children, working age adults, and the elderly in 1970, 2000, and what is projected for 2030. In a pie graph, each slice of the pie represents a share of the total, or a percentage. For example, 50% would be half of the pie, 20% would be one-fifth, and so on. Continue. The three pie graphs show that the share of the U.S. population 65 and over is growing. The pie graphs allow you to get a feel for the relative size of the different age groups from 1970 to 2000 to 2030, without requiring you to slog through the specific numbers and percentages in the table. Some common examples of how pie graphs are used include dividing the population into groups by age, income level, ethnicity, religion, occupation, dividing different firms into different categories by size, industry, number of employees, and dividing up government spending or taxes into its main categories. Types of graphs, bar charts, or bar graphs. Use the height of different bars to compare quantities. Bar graphs can be subdivided in a way that reveals information similar to what we can get from pie charts. It's sometimes easier for a reader to run his or her eyes across several bar graphs comparing the shaded areas rather than trying to compare several pie graphs. Continuing with this, the three bar graphs are based on the information from the chart about the U.S. age distribution in 1970, 2000, and 2030. Graph A shows three bars for each year, representing the total number of persons in each age bracket for each year. Graph B shows just one bar for each year but the different age groups are now shaded inside the bar. Graph C, still based on the same data, the vertical axis measures percentages rather than numbers of persons. Types of graphs comparisons. How do you know which graph to use for your data? Bar graphs are especially useful when comparing quantities. For example, if you're studying the populations of different countries, bar graphs can show the relationship between the population sizes of multiple countries. Not only can it show these relationships, but it can also show breakdowns of different groups within the population. Pie graphs are often better than line graphs at showing how an overall group is divided. However, if a pie graph has too many slices, it becomes difficult to interpret. Types of graphs. Comparisons continued. How do you know which graph to use? Line graphs are often the most effective format for illustrating a relationship between two variables that are both changing. For example, time series graphs can show patterns as time changes, like the unemployment rate over time. Line graphs are widely used in economics to pretend, present continuous data about prices, wages, quantities bought and sold, and the size of the economy. So a quick review from module one. What if scarcity explain its economic impact? That should say, what is scarcity? What are productive resources? What is opportunity cost and its importance in decision making? Why do trade and markets exist? What is the difference between macroeconomics and microeconomics? Why are economic models useful to economists? What are common economic models? 
How are equations and functions used to describe relationships? What are the cause and effects? What proper order of operations is used while solving simple equations with variables? How does a graph show the relationship between two variables? How do you differentiate between a positive relationship and a negative relationship? How do you interpret economic information on a graph? And that's all for now, folks.